first off, I was really interested in the documentary and a little bit, of, I wanted to hear a little bit about that sort of first moment after the tragedy and your decision to come together as a group and to, to, you know, to fight for gun control. What was going through your guys' head? I mean, I think most people at, at that stage would have just, you know, wanted to, to shy away and, and live with their grief. But what made you guys want, really want to, to, to take this head on? Well, th that's complicated. I think that inherently there was a vindictive nature towards it. And what was fueling us was, you know, it, we very quickly came to the realization almost instantly while we were still locked up in our school, not knowing when we were going to get out, we came to the realization that this is a policy failure. This mass shooting is simply a policy fa failure. And that means that there are people making these policies who need to be held accountable. So, you know, it wasn't as though we came together for some sort of kumbaya hand-holding ceremony and then decided to um, protest. We came together unnaturally. <laughs> uh, it was a scattered time and everybody just ended up gravitating towards each other and suddenly we're all in my home, eating my food, sleeping on my floor, not knowing what's going on. And as every day goes by, three people get added to the group so many different things come about. It was it was just chaos. I mean, the city of Parkland was in a, it felt as though we were not within the laws of time and space. Truly the city was unlike anything we had seen before because, you know, we're from a small privileged, you know, upper middle class town. And, um, and we had such a routine. Parkland's a small town. We have a, only a handful of restaurants and very few businesses. It's just really residential in a high school. So when, you're, when your schedule goes from, you know, simply going to school, going home, doing homework, seeing your friends to pure anarchy, it's going to throw you for a loop. So there wasn't really some sort of calling where we all decided, let's unify in this one moment. It all just came together. When you started organizing the March for Our Lives, um, were you amazed at the level of in national interest and how you were able to pull all these people together? And I mean, my mom who was 80 years old, went to that, went to that march. And um, it, it just, it, it, were you shocked by the level of, of interest and the level of passion that you got from people when so yes. many people had especially, not gotten it? Well, especially since we thought that that was gonna end up doing anything. Suddenly, we're here with uh, President Biden and a Democratic Senate and House, and we are getting absolute bullshit gun laws from them. We are getting the most technocratic, basic, popular stuff. And look, that's the Biden presidency writ large. But it's um, it was really cool at the time because we thought that that support from those people was going to get uh, our government to do anything. And look, that was back when the Republicans were in charge and we were a bit, now I can only speak for myself, I was a bit short-sighted and I said, look, they're gonna see all these people take to the streets and they're gonna realize this is what America wants. Obviously, if you've known politics for more than one year or more than one minute, you know that that's not how it works. But the really pathetic thing to see is the fact that, despite the fact that the Democrats have the wheel right now in every regard, it's looking like we're getting the things from Biden that are like more than 50% popular with Republicans anyway. You know, we, we, we spent a lot of time, put, our, put a lot of our lives, you know, right into something. And now the political party that bolstered us up the whole time is massively undelivering. And it's pretty depressing. And it's, it's very unfortunate to see. And I know that a lot of people in the gun violence prevention community are extremely disappointed with what we're going to be seeing from the Biden administration. Unless, of course, they get their act together. But you know, that's hope, being hopeful. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you guys plan any specific um, ways to lobby uh, the Biden administration? And, you know, I guess the holdup is really the Senate as well. You know, the whole vibe with the Biden administration is that they're just going to use mansion and cinema being horrible as an excuse to not do things. You know, Biden administration under delivers, boom, mansion and cinema. You want a law passed, then the Biden administration won't take action on it, boom, mansion and cinema. So look, I mean, 
what are we going to expect? Did we think that the Biden administration was going to be the administration to give us the progressive changes we need? No, it's an administration completely playing defense that is just propping us up to lose the House and the Senate in 2022. Yeah. So I want to hear a little bit about personally what this experience has been like for you to, you know, suddenly be thrust into the middle of a big national debate like that. What is it? What is this amount of attention and, and notoriety, you know, been for you personally? Uh, I mean, you know, it's uh, ego crushing. It, it blows you up and then knocks you down. It makes you think that you're all special and then makes you think that you're the only person in the world who isn't special. And I happened to, during this time of the shooting, also not be medicating my pretty, you know, pretty hefty bipolar disorder. So not only did we have this trauma, not only were we going to these funerals and seeing this grief, um, myself and also other people that I worked with were also dealing with unrelated mental health issues that go, that can be traced back to before the shooting. So I didn't know what was going on. I had a very warped sense of reality at the time. Fortunately, I was pretty, uh, my, my opinions on guns were pretty good at the time uh, and continue to be. So at least I had that. Um, I can't speak much about my personal mental health at the time, but I look back at what I say about guns and I'm like, all right, that was all pretty good. Um, and that's the best I could do, right? But it's, uh, it's horrible. I mean, what the American media did with Parkland, they needed something. The America fetishizes young people taking the reins from the adults and saving everybody's asses. Because look, oh, Gen Z's coming over to save the day. Suddenly we get to feel relaxed and as though we don't have the responsibility to do this ourselves. All the adults say that, oh, we retweet Gen Z, we talk about how inspiring these kids are, and that's great, we, we did it. We, we saved the day, we let the kids lead the way. And then, you know, while all of this fancy media circus carousel nonsense is happening about the kids and how the kids are leading, it's been three years and we have not seen substantial gun reform. Yeah. I think the Parkland kids could be, we could be considered America's excuse for gun control, right? America spent a lot of time and money uh, propping us up and moving us around. And while we were the, while we were the bell of the ball, not a lot of gun control happened. Yeah. The thing about gun control, and, and this is something that I, ha I struggle communicating with other people in the Parkland community about, the thing that a lot of people have trouble realizing is that nobody gives a shit about guns. Gun control is not its own issue. Gun control is a symptom of other serious issues in the country, be it um, police violence, race violence, and uh, mental health specifically. Um, but there's, but th th that's the thing, you know, you've got people like Beto O'Rourke, who is a savvy politician, a charming, handsome guy, but he ran a single issue presidential campaign on gun reform. When if you ask everyone in the country what they think the top five biggest problems in our country are, people aren't going to say guns. People need health care. People need white supremacy to end. People need the police to stay out of their fucking neighborhoods you know gun get banning ar-15s is an immensely popular thing and it's something that a lot of americans can get behind but in terms of where they place it on their actual you know list of things that need to get done it's not up there and you see that and and it's unfortunate but you need to weave gun violence into other issues and not treat it as its own monolithic thing because as we've seen that doesn't go anywhere for anyone yeah so give us an update about where you are now, what, what, what you're up to with, uh, with your group, and tell us, tell us a little bit about what happens. Well, since the bizarre thing with March for Our Lives is almost nobody from Parkland, uh, or at least from MSD at the time of the shooting, is actually in the organization anymore. You know, I think everybody across the board is supportive of it, but you know, people have things to do. People gotta go pay for college. There's this assumption that people who have big Instagram and Twitter accounts and are verified on those pages are able to make money. That is not an inherent thing. I am actually working uh, in some places that were not normally my fields of expertise just to pay the rent. I can't even go to college right now because I got to figure out a way to pay for that. So we're just literally Gen Z right now. Nothing special or interesting about us. Um, you know, I mean, obviously you've got some really, really bright stars in the group that are going to go on to do incredible things. You know, some of us will be normal individuals. Who knows? 
All I know is that if I wake up tomorrow morning, that is a victory and that's something to celebrate and it will be every morning from there on. Yeah.